Hi, Year 12. Um, today we're going to annotate Chapter 16 of Dracula. Um, chapter 16 could be argued to legitimise and justify male violence against uh, women, specifically women who do not conform to gender norms, which existed um, at the time Stoker was writing at the fin de siècle uh, towards the end of the 19th century, uh, which was obviously a patriarchal society. Um, when we're annotating, I will be alluding to this as we go through. Um, obviously, that means that Phyllis Ross's essay is still really relevant. So please do refresh your uh, memory of that if you can. Right, pens out, highlight, step, let's go. We open with Van Helsing leading the forces for good into the churchyard at night time. Van Helsing is at this stage clearly the leader um, and that's conveyed in, in numerous ways throughout the chapter but I'll just pick out one here. Uh, Van Helsing is slightly in front so the preposition phrase there in front indicates to you that he is leading um, and then also you've got uh, the verb phrase entering first a little bit later so he is trying to um, Stoker, sorry, is trying to convey that Van Helsing is very much the person in charge at the moment. And that's because within this chapter, he's essentially um, first performing an experiment and then using the results of that experiment to justify his actions a little bit later. Um, so they're going into Lucy's tomb. At this stage, it's still really unclear as to what Van Helsing wishes to do um, beyond access Lucy's tomb um, and therefore there's an ambiguity and that's really connoted by the repetition of the uh, noun mystery, the abstract noun mystery. So we've got a kind of puzzle, puzzle that needs to be solved at this stage. The verb unlocked reminds us of the Gothic convention of secrets and hidden uh, hidden rooms, hidden locations. Um, and therefore, what we feel is within this chapter, something is going to be unlocked, something is going to be revealed to the uh, fellow protagonists. And that clearly is going to be Lucy's vampirism. When we are going into the tomb, um, Van Helsing is described as lighting a dark lantern, certainly something that seems quite oxymoronic. Um, can lanterns be dark? Aren't they meant to be light? Isn't that the whole point? Um, and what's indicated through that oxymoron is that within this sphere, the tomb of Lucy, there's going to be very little light, very little hope, if you like, symbolic light. When they look into the coffin, they find that there is nothing there. That's shown through the exclamative, single sentence paragraph, the coffin was empty. So the mystery continues. Why is Lucy out uh, of her coffin? At seeing the absence of Lucy in the coffin, the men are describing as recoiling. Now, the verb recoiled uh, doesn't just mean to kind of move back upon yourself. It simultaneously means that you are repulsed. Uh, so if I said I recoiled from, uh, I don't know, eating chips, silly, silly notion in and of itself, um, I would be disgusted by the, the concept. So there's a kind of double meaning to that particular verb. And what it indicates to us is that they're, they're surprised, shocked by the coffin being empty, but also disgusted that something appears to have happened to Lucy. Indeed, the first person that they attempt to lay blame on, even though it's in a terribly polite manner, Quincy Morris uh, gives us the interrogative, is this your doing? And the direct address there is uh, in reference to Van Helsing. So, I mean, why do they assume that it's Van Helsing? Well, it's because he shares many traits with Dracula and that makes him um, suspicious. And this is where we get, you know, a sense of some of the xenophobia that was uh, within England at the end of the 19th century. And, you know, let's be honest, still is today. Um, Van Helsing is a man who is foreign. He's from Amsterdam. Van Helsing is a man who believes in things that the others do not believe in. He believes in supernatural agency. He believes in... Um, methods which are not founded in science sometimes and therefore yeah it makes him suspicious it makes him it seem like the kind of person who would do something akin to what Dracula is doing. At this point we have 
exposition, more information being revealed to the other characters. What's nice is that through the homodiegetic structure of the novel, this is information we're already privy to. Uh, so Van Helsing explains to Arthur and Quincy that they have previously come to this tomb, that they have previously seen something white coming through the trees. This is an anaphoric reference to the previous appearance of Lucy. And what's useful to look at here is the noun something, which indicates to you that it's not a person, it is a thing, it is a monster, and therefore is uh, liable to be destroyed by the forces for good. Van Helsing is continuing his anecdote uh, relating to Arthur and Quincy, what he and John Seward experienced the previous time they were in the churchyard. Um, and he points out that one more so small child was missing. Now, there's an, a level of horror that's being exacerbated here by the language use of Stoker. It's not just a small child, it's a so small child. Um, so if we look at that uh, intensifier, so, and the premodifier, small, what we're building up uh, through that sibilant phrase is that this was somebody who was incredibly vulnerable and whatever the something white was, it was, it obviously had nefarious intent to prey upon something so vulnerable. At this point, um, we have some further information. So Van Helsing adds, yesterday I came here before sundown, for at sundown the undead can move. That's exposition, that's information that we are being given there. It shows us the limitations of the undead. Uh, I have met mentioned before that it's fascinating uh, the way the word undead is structured. Um, here you can see there's a hyphen used, um, which indicates that this is a word that's only just uh, being created. It's a neologism for the time period. Uh, if we were to write undead today, we wouldn't bother with a hyphen because that word undead is something that's been around for a good century or so. Um, but here it is a neologism, it's a new word. Um, because of the compound nature of it. Uh, so yes, before sundown, at sundown, that temporal diaxis indicates to you the limitations of the undead, but also their strengths, okay? So at sundown, at that liminal time frame, as I saw it said in the last video, that threshold period, uh, the undead's powers are regained. So it tells us that you have to be really strategic if you're on the forces for good, because you have, uh, you know, far less, far fewer, should I say, um, powers. Uh, you're not you're not super strong either. Um, so you have to be really strategic. What he wants the uh, fellows to do is to wait with him outside. Wait you with me outside. So that is the imperative that tells you that. So we're all going to watch and see if Lucy appears, essentially. Um, just to remind you, obviously, the fact that that particular imperative has really peculiar syntax. syntax. That's not the way we'd say it, is it? Wait you with me outside. We'd say, wait with me outside. Um, the syntax indicates to you that English is not his, his uh, first language um, and therefore shows to you, yes, he is their leader, but simultaneously he is somebody who is potentially suspicious. Uh, they have to put their faith in him, their trust in him. And he is also somebody who is other and therefore more likely to be able to have the knowledge, the insider knowledge uh, to combat a fellow suspicious other like Dracula. OK. So, um, at this point, the men are outside the tomb and Seward, so it's still his perspective, says that he, he finds the night air really nice after the terror of that vault. Let's just remind ourselves what was in that vault. Uh, nothing. So there was nothing in there but the concept of uh, Lucy breaking the boundary, exiting the tomb. Uh, it's that idea that frightens him. It's not the actual vault. It's the idea of Lucy's new capacity um, for, for a power beyond that which ordinary humans have. Uh, whilst he's waiting outside, Seward uses this figurative language, the scudding clouds crossing and passing like the gladness and sorrow of a man's life. 
So what's interesting here with that simile is that he is trying to show you that, you know, life is short. It doesn't last very long. Perhaps he's reflecting on, you know, the loss of Lucy. But also he's pointing out um, something about mortality. And what we are reminded with this simile is that Lucy currently has immortality. So there is a profound difference now between the woman he loves um, and how he used to view her as dead to the woman who that person has become. She is now immortal. Also, it just shows you the difference between what they're taking on and who they are. Dracula is immortal. That's going to be tough for a series of mortal men um, to beat. As I've said before many times, this novel um, was initially crit criticised by the newspaper The Spectator, I think, um, who said that um, it, the novel's modernity seemed to undermine the fantastical elements in it. Um, but but as, as I've said before, Rosemary Jackson says that, you know, a successful fantasy novel is one that mixes the mimetic with the marvellous. So the realistic, the mimetic with the marvellous, the fantastical, a really good book, um, a really effective fantasy book won't be exclusively either. It will meld the two. And so you see here, we've just been inside a vault where, you know, a dead woman is walking. And then we have a reflection of reality. Whilst all this is happening, we can hear far away the muffled roar that marks the life of a great city, London. So that noun phrase, great city, reminds us it's happening on our doorstep. It could be happening to you soon if Dracula's inverse colonial, colonialization is successful. Um, so it, it kind of brings back to the reader a little bit of the mimesis um, after the kind of marvellous event of this uh, chapter, wherein she's not in the coffin. So the mystery mystery is still there. Um, why is she not in her coffin? But whilst Arthur is still perceiving it as such, Seward says he's half inclined again to throw aside doubt and to accept Van Helsing's conclusions. So Van uh, Seward is consistently uh, moving on a trajectory between belief and incredulity and and it's by openly doing that by explicitly talking about um should we believe in this or should we not and making it an internal dialogue that our protagonists have what that does is it it places the reader it positions the reader should i say adjacent to that character and therefore builds empathy um, and we really do experience this chapter with as Seward. It's one of the benefits of homodiegetic narration. Whilst they're waiting outside the tomb for something to happen, Van Helsing starts to place around the door of the tomb a kind of putty along the, uh, the join of the door, if you like. And one of the characters has just asked him, what is that? What are you putting around the door of that tomb? And he says, the host. Uh, that minor sentence seems very uh, peculiar to a modern reader. What he's talking about is, is the Holy Spirit. Um, what he's talking about is that he has ground up sacred wafers, so wafers that are seemingly blessed by God and place them around the door of the tomb. Um, what this pragmatically means is that Lucy, according to vampiric, vampiric sorry, mythology, which Van Helsing has previously uh, stated, what that means is that Lucy cannot go back inside her tomb at the moment. But what it tells us about Van, Van Helsing's characterization is something a little bit more unsettling. Again, you always want your reader to be perturbed. You always want your reader to be on a knife set edge in a gothic novel. And here we're placing all our faith into a man who actually eats wafers like that's his that's something he enjoys to do. And that's really naughty. That's very um, blasphemous. He says, I have an indulgence. Oof, that simple sentence would not be well received. It would not create positive face uh, with a religious British readership. Um, so again, we're constantly veering between should we trust Van Helsing or should we not? Uh, just alongside Seward. 
And those those uh, wafers are described by Seward's narration as the most sacred of things. So that superlative uh, indicates to you, you know, the shock of what Van Helsing is doing there. Whilst awaiting outside, uh, Seward uses anaphora to describe his experience. Never did tombs look so ghastly white. Never did cypress or yew or juniper so seem the embodiment of funereal gloom. Never did trees or grass wave or rustle so ominously. Never did bough creak so mysteriously. And never did the faraway howling of dogs send such a woeful presage through the night. Oh, there's loads of techniques in there that I could talk about. Um, but the anaphora here ties together a series of images which indicate to us um, Dracula's influence. There's, there's, there's a semantic field of death which is clear with the word tombs and funer funereal. Uh, we've got the howling of dogs. When did we last hear those howling of dogs? Well, it was when Dracula was in charge of them. So these moments are kind of tied together to show you uh, the influence of, of Dracula. But there's also some like polysynthetic listing here, for example, the trees, cypress or yew or juniper, which are trees that are beautiful and fresh. And here they seem to have been transformed into something unnatural. And the trees, grasses, tree or grass wave or rustle, uh, the noises, the sound iconicity of those particular verbs wave and rustle um, also create tension. Okay, so moving on to the bit that we're all waiting for, the arrival of Lucy. Um, so, Van uh, Seward writes, we saw a white figure advance, a dim white figure. So you can clearly see there's some amplification there. We go from the noun phrase white figure to the extended noun phrase dim white figure. Okay, um, why add the dim? Well, because it's still not clear. You still can't quite tell that it's Lucy yet. Uh, the white figure, the noun phrase in and of itself, reminds us, of course, of the white lady in Whitby, the ghost of the white woman at Whitby Abbey. Um, therefore, again, conveying this idea that she's transformed into something supernatural, something undead. The thing that I've highlighted first in green here is one of the moments wherein you can see that Lucy has transformed from a woman who is very attractive to men to a woman who is unnatural. OK, she's a dim white figure which held something dark at its breast. So I'm going to really like zoom in on that final preposition phrase at its breast loads you can do here one what is usually at the breast it's a baby and a baby you nurture what about the pronoun it's well it indicates to you it's no longer a woman uh it's it's something else it's something alien it's something other then we've got Lucy described as a dark haired woman in contrast to the fair haired child. Obviously, the juxtaposition between the word, the adjective dark and the adjective fair indicates to you that the child is innocent and Lucy has started to become um, something which is more ominous. Um, it, very rarely previously have you heard Lucy being described as a dark haired woman. It's all been about her, you know, beauty. But here she's become something ominous because that focus has turned to the one aspect of her visual character um, that seems 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 dark. Literally. Uh, OK, eventually we recognise the features of Lucy Westenra, Lucy Westenra, but yet now how changed. So you can see here one sentence ends with the proper noun Lucy Westenra and the next sentence starts with the same pro proper noun Lucy Westenra. This is called anadiplosis. The focus is all upon that name. And it tells us through that anadiplosis from one sentence to the next that she has had a transformation. That transfa transformation is indicated as the description goes on. Uh, her sweetness has turned to adamantine, heartless cruelty. So like it's strong as metal. It's without care. It's mean. The purity has turned to voluptuous wantonness. These 
these descriptions clearly indicate to you, and they are noun phrases, voluptuous wantonness, adamine, heartless cruelty, they're both noun phrases. They both indicate to you that she is no longer representing uh, the stereotypical gender norms at the time. She is unnatural. Um, instead of being nurturing, she's cruel. Instead of being warm, she's cold like metal. Instead of being pure and innocent, she's sexy. And not only is she sexy, she has desires and she's attractive and she's attracting you. Um, these are meant to be deeply unsettling. Uh, her lips are crimson with fresh blood. So we know now that Lucy is drinking from this innocent child and that blood stained the purity of her lawn death robe. So symbolically, we've got a white dress being stained by the blood of the child. So Lucy's innocence has been completely lost in this uh, new representation of a new Lucy Westenra. How do the men react? Well, they all shudder with horror. Notice how in this section um, it stops being about I for Seward. It starts to be about we. Seeing Lucy transform into a horror, into a horrible, sexy, um, powerful, undead woman causes the men to join together. It's the thing that glues their group together once and for all. So that's why we've moved from I to we. It's because right now they are acting and feeling as one. Seeing Lucy in her changed state emasculates the men, OK? You can see that because Van Helsing's iron nerve had failed, OK? So that verb failed indicates he's become emasculated. Um, Arthur, if he's not been held up by Seward, he would have fallen. Uh, again, that verb indicates to you that he feels utterly emasculated by Lucy's transition. However, it doesn't stop there. When Lucy, I call the thing that was before us Lucy because it bore her shape. When she saw us, she drew back with an angry snarl. OK, so first of all, you've got the false start there. Uh, when Lucy, I call the thing that was before us Lucy because it bore her shape. That indicates to you that Seward is... Um, he, he's unsure of how to label this creature that is before him. Uh, there's almost a double. This is one. This is two people in one body. Um, this is two souls in one body, if you like. And what we're left with is something that's quite animalistic. That's indicated by angry snarl, um, particularly that that noun snarl. Then when we look at Lucy, she's got unclean eyes which are full of hellfire. Uh, I'd really focus in and circle please that adjective unclean because we will see that it is reused later when Dracula starts to attack Mina. If her eyes are unclean that means that they're dirty, okay? Um, there's something that has been ruined or stained. Her reputation is not the least of those things. Uh, obviously, if they're full of hellfire, we can see that she's on the side of the demon. She's on the side of Satan. She's on Dracula's side when she is in this manifestation. At this point, Seward says, had she then to be killed, I would have done it with savage delight. Now, I'm buying uh, most of that clause, uh, but not all of it. Uh, two clauses, sorry. Uh, in the second clause, it's the part when he says, I could have done it with savage delight. That's the part that, that indicates to me that there is a, a celebration, a legitimization of destroying a woman who is other than what you expect. Someone, who, a woman who frightens you, a woman who is sexual, a woman who is who is potentially, you know, therefore dangerous. Uh, again, her eyes are blazing with unholy light, that pre-modifier indicating to you that she is against God and therefore by killing her, they believe they will be on the side of God, on the side of the angels. Her smile is described as voluptuous. That adjective comes up again and again and again, especially the first time it appears is with the three vampire women in Dracula's castle and it indicates to us a sexuality and a sensuality which emasculates men and makes them feel uh, almost passive, like it completely unmans them. 
She throws the child to the ground with a careless motion. That adjective indicates to you that she's not nurturing and therefore is unnatural. Um, the child that was, again, it was to her breast. So indicating that she has rejected that maternal imagery. And when she throws it to the ground, she growls over it similarly as a dog growl, growls over a bone. So Lucy does not see the child now as a, a person or somebody to empathise with. It is an object. It is something to be consumed. So you can see her trans transition to vampirism. But simultaneously, you can see that there is an unnatural quality to her womanhood as represented in this chapter. There was a cold-bloodedness in the act which wrung a groan from Arthur. Why does it ring a groan from Arthur? Because he was going to be her husband. So the notion of Lucy rejecting um, the role of a wife and mother in, in symbolically, in, sorry, in literally dropping the child to the ground uh, shows to Arthur that that Lucy has gone. Um, what does she do next? Well, again, she does something which a woman should not do if she is an appropriately behaved woman for the fin de siècle, for the end of the 19th century. She advanced. So she's taking the first step. She's being forward with that verb. She has a wanton smile. She's sexy. She's attractive. And she has outstretched arms. Um, that noun phrase indicates to you that she's welcoming Arthur. She wants to hold him. Now, ordinarily, we'd expect this to be the other way around. Women should should be sexually passive if we are going according to tra um, traditional Victorian notions of sexuality. So this makes us almost akin to 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 a prostitute. Um, to you know, a, if we are really judgmental, which I'm not. I love Lucy. That uh, incredibly forward, progressive, uh, dangerous representation of Lucy as an aggressive sexual woman is evident in her direct speech. You've got the repetition of the imperative, come to me, Arthur, come to me. And then we've got synecdoche used here. My arms are hungry for you. So the arms are used to symbolise the whole. That's when we know it's synecdoche, a little bit like uh, all, our, all hands on deck, if you're familiar with that phrase. The hands represent the whole body. But what's interesting here is that by instead of saying, I am hungry for you, she says my arms. So it becomes something physical as opposed to um, something more to do with a kind of ethereal love, if you like, or uh, a mental longing. It's something physical by using that synecdoche. Um, additionally, obviously, the adjective hungry connotes um, the vampiric quality of her character now. But it could also connote a kind of sexuality. Um, and that is, is frightening to the men who are witnessing it. Seward points out that there's something diabolically sweet in her tone. The uh, primodifier diabolically means devilishly, um, implying that her sensuality is, is, is evil. OK, and Arthur moves forward seemingly under a spell indicating perhaps her ability to hypnotise others. We have to remember um, what we learned a couple of chapters ago, which was that Dracula used a form of hypnotism to gain access to Lucy and to drink from Lucy. Um, and perhaps here Lucy is using that same method with Arthur. Uh, connoting her supernatural abilities. And that's also kind of, uh, clear, <laughs> can't speak today, in some of the, the verb use. So as soon as he opens his arms under that spell, she's leaping for them. That verb implies she's either kind of superhuman or she's animalistic, whatever you think. Um, but there, there's, there's certainly a, a level of desire within that verb, a, a desperation. At this point, Van Helsing intervenes and he holds up a crucifix and she is, is really disturbed by that. And she has what's described as a distorted face. So you can see that there's something uncanny about Lucy. She looks like Lucy. She's not quite acting like Lucy. And her face is distorted. It's it's there. It's the right face, but it's not quite 
in the shape that it should be. And that particular noun phrase really does indicate the uncanny. The uncanny is Freud's concept that um, within things that frighten us, there's this juxtaposition between the familiar and the unfamiliar. Canny is a translation of the German word heimlich, unheimlich. Heimlich means homely. So it's something that we recognise from home mixed with something that we don't. Uh, and that's what generates um, a really deep seated level of perturbation within us. And that's really indicated by this description of Lucy. Um, so she then goes towards the tomb, having seen that she cannot uh, gain Arthur. And she can't go through the door because there's some kind of irresistible force. Uh, this noun phrase is in reference to the fact that she can't enter the door because of Van Helsing's um, interventions. He's placed sacred wafer all the way around the door so she can't get in. She's deeply upset by this. And you can tell by the imagery which Stoker uses. I'm going to flag up two similes here. So um, because she can't access the tomb, her brows are wrinkled as though the folds of the flesh were the coils of Medusa's snakes. Uh, remember Medusa, this is a mythological illusion as well as a simile. Medusa is a, is a wrong woman who has, um, formerly beautiful, one of the Gorgons, who has uh, snakes for hair. And if you look at her, you turn to stone. Um, Medusa is a, is a mythological figure who is absolutely consumed by bitterness um, and, and hates men as a result of her previous experiences with the gods. And therefore, you can see that there's a kind of fear of misandry here. There's a misandry is a hatred of men. There's a fear of the woman who hates men uh, within this simile. Her mouth then opens and it's described as an open square, as in the passion masks of the Greeks and Japanese. And this simile indicates to you the double face of Lucy, that um, again, the uncanny, that there is a face there, but it seems to be like a mask. It seems to be something other than the face uh, which you are witnessing. So, yeah, that, that second simile connotes to you the uncanny. At this point, having seen poor Lucy so transformed, Arthur falls to his knees and he basically begs Van Helsing to do what he wants. He says, uh, there can be no horror like this ever anymore. Um, what's the horror that he's seen? It's a woman. Uh, who has thrown down a small child. Yep, I mean, that's not very nice, is it? But is this the worst, hor most horrific thing we've ever seen? I, I, I'm, I don't know. Um, certainly seems mildly hyperbolic to me. But then I'm slightly biased towards Lucy. Um, so yeah, he's disgusted by what he sees. The woman with a corporeal body, as real at that moment as our own, passed in through the interstice where scarce a knife blade, scarce a knife blade could have gone. So at this point, after Arthur has said, you know, do what you want to, Van Helsing, we see Lucy do something completely supernatural that proves that she is no longer human. When Van Helsing removes the putty from round the tomb door, she goes through the crack. That's impossible. Having proven that Lucy is not dead and not in her coffin, but is now undead, uh, potentially evil, and also what's far worse, really, really sexy. Um, Van Helsing now assures Arthur it's all going to be fine. They're going to come back the next day and sort it all out. He uses uh, some figurative language to assure Arthur of this. You are now in the bitter waters, my child. By this time tomorrow, you will, please God, have passed them and have drunk of the sweet waters. Um, so you can see that figurative language is used to show that um, whatever they're going to do the next day is going to make Arthur feel much better. What are they going to do the next day? Oh, just chop off a head. <laughs> 